now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. 706 on O'Connor and Company. It's Larry O'Connor with Julie Gunlock. We just want to go on the record and say that neither of us have taken any sort of mysterious secret medical leave or any sort of hospitalization at the ICU that we have not notified the proper chain of authority about and command structure about. Isn't that There you correct? go. Yes. Unlike the Secretary of Defense of the United <laughs> States of America. But, you know, that's no big Everything's deal. Everything's fine. No. Coming up later in this very Monday morning program, you'll hear at 735 from Trevor Maddich putting an end to the Ron Rivera era in Washington, D.C. football. 805, Tom Fitton of Judicial Watch and his uh, wrongful death lawsuit on behalf of Ashley Babbitt's family. And then at 835, Representative Chip Roy of Texas. That's a lot. And... It gets even better because joining us right now is Joe DeGeneva, former U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia and a good friend of the program. Hey, Joe, happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Good morning. And isn't it great? We now know where the Secretary of Defense is. It is really. We. I'm proud of our nation today. <laughs> this is, I mean, it's, it's weird and it is a punchline, but it's also incredibly disconcerting. And by the way, is it legal? Is it legal for the Secretary of Defense, who's part of the chain of command and part of the, the you know, the, the, um, uh, what do you call it? The presidential succession, right? The the uh-huh. yeah. Um, yeah. well, is it is it is it? it, it I mean, it's just fine for him to just sort of check out no. for a few days and not let no, the chain of command know. No, it's not actually. Uh, there are protocols in place, very very detailed protocols for what happens when a person who's in the line of succession, particularly the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Defense, especially the Secretary of Defense, uh, are incapacitated, which he was. By the way, he was incapacitated. If he's in an intensive care unit at Walter Reed and under sedation, he is incapacitated. So somebody needs to be fired, including the Secretary of Defense himself. You'll remember when he started his tenure, when he was nominated, he made a big deal out of the foul fact that how he, as a black military officer, was ignored by everybody in the room. Mm -hmm. And that's what he remembered from his service. The reason he was ignored is that he's not very bright. (laughs) And nobody wanted to hear what he had to say. And so there's a part of me that says, since he decided not to tell us where he was, I felt safer because I knew that others were in charge. Mm -hmm. But now that I know where he is, I am worried because it shows his dereliction of duty, he should be fired. But he won't be by Joe Biden, who loves incompetence around him. And boy, does he have it in just abandoned. One other point on this, though, Joe, I mean, one of his early acts in the first year as Secretary of Defense was to discharge thousands of members of the military if they didn't get the COVID shot. Yeah, The COVID shot that actually had no uh, effective uh, uh, reaction to stopping the virus or preventing the virus from spreading. So people were discharged on a lie. They lost their military careers because of this man, and yet this man just violated the chain of command, violated all of these things. There's no reason why he should be able to keep his job. But as you said, if the president doesn't fire him, is there an impeachment possibility well, here well. at Congress? Can they? Well, Congress can barely impeach Mallorca, so I don't expect them to try to impeach uh, an African-American member of the cabinet uh, because they don't have the cojones to do that. The Republicans are feckless on the issue of impeachment anyway. They can do all the grandstanding over the last couple of weeks about how they're organizing themselves and being very careful about dotting the I's and crossing the T's. They are gutless up on Capitol Hill. They are utterly gutless. They have the power. They don't know how to wield it. They don't want to wield it. He'll get away with this. He, Austin, will get away with this because he's black and because he's a Democrat. If he were anything else, he should be fired. Impeachment is out of the question because Republicans don't know how to do it. So, Joe, on Friday, Biden made his first campaign speech near Valley Forge. And the entire time I was watching, all I could think of is Monday when we get to talk to Joe DeGeneva. Because <laughs> all I want to hear is your reaction to the sort of Trump could destroy America speech given by Biden. 
Well, what's fascinating about this is people have just put your thinking caps on for a minute. January 6th is now playing a double role. It is the centerpiece of the Biden campaign. It is also the centerpiece of his Department of Justice continuing prosecutions. They have now announced a new wave of potential prosecutions against those who were in restricted areas on the mall and around the Capitol. Now, this is lunacy. Here you have a city, Washington, D.C., where the United States Attorney Matthew Graves is AWOL on local crime because he is consumed by January 6th prosecutions. And now the president of the United States goes to Valley Forge and gives a speech which can only be described as Goebbels-like in its idiocy, its vileness, and its design to divide the country. I mean, Biden is a very, very sick individual, but it's worse than that. He's surrounded by sick individuals. Can you imagine the moron that wrote that speech? What you have to do to get up in the morning and write a speech like that? You have to be an idiot. And that's what Bi- that's Biden's problem. He's incapacitated. He has the groveling wife who, you know, basically is Mrs. Wilson squared. <laughs> and then you have surrounded by an incompetent staff and a secretary of defense who disappears, and an attorney general who thinks January 6th is the worst thing that ever happened in American history. Just look at the list of loons. I have a thing in my pocket I carry. It's called the list of loons, (laughs) and it's getting longer every day with the Biden administration. Um, the the use of January sixth, Joe, as you put it, in the, in the, in mm-hmm. the the language in this speech, which was uh, well, here I'll give people a little flavor of it, a quick montage. I make this sacred <laughs> pledge to you: the defense, <laughs> protection, and preservation of American democracy will remain as it has been the central cause of my presidency. The central cause of his presidency is preserving <laughs> American democracy or the democratic process, to be more accurate, because we, of course, are not a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. But the democratic process that is used to elect our representatives, I don't know, Joe, but I've been seeing the headlines recently. He seems to, Joe Biden seems to be spearheading, undermining the democratic process at every turn. Well, well, as you know, uh, for those of us who were drafted in the Vietnam War, we all remember the, say, the saying, You must destroy the village in order to save it. Hmm. And what Joe Biden has done through his brazen synchronization of his campaign about January 6th with the Department of Justice uh, weaponization of January 6th and the indictments of President Trump is he has weaponized government in the worst anti-democratic way that you could possibly imagine. What they are doing is They are lying in every speech, lying in every public pronouncement, and it just remains to be seen. This is pretty simple stuff, Uh, whether or not the American people are smart enough and will vote enough to throw this bum out of office. Because make no mistake about it, Joe Biden is a bum. We have a bum for president. Not only are they grifters, the entire Biden family, but they're bums. And the fact is, this is a pretty clear-cut choice. I mean, as, as, you know, as Richard Nixon used to say, a choice, not an echo. Uh, this is pretty clear. Uh, you either elect somebody who's been president and ran a pretty good country for four years, or you put the bum back in office. Joe DeGeneva, we'll leave it there. Bums and loons. Is that going to be the name of your new book? <laughs> I like it. That's it. It's, it's coming out shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Always good to have you. It's 715 to... WMAL. Making sense of the news. Live. From the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since 1939. WMAL. Making sense of the markets. Because generational wealth doesn't build itself. Download the WMAL app to stream us for free. Remember on Friday, or actually all week last week, we were talking about Joe Biden's cynical use of Valley Forge as a backdrop for this uh, anti-Republican, anti-American speech about January 6th that he gave on Friday. And we pointed out that, you know, he's more than happy to use George Washington and the soldiers of Valley Forge as a political prop to, you know, paint his political opponents as enemies of the Constitution. 
But then the next day, he'll be tearing down statues of George Washington as the white colonial slave owner that he is, yeah. right? This yeah. is who Joe Biden is. This is who the Democrats running this administration are. And, you know, we said that as a rhetorical device. But here we go. Actual ripped right from the headlines in Pennsylvania, 48 hours after the speech at Valley Forge, protecting our Constitution and protecting our freedoms, the Biden administration has announced that a statue of William Penn, you know, that Penn from Pennsylvania, (laughs) William Penn statue, will be ripped down from a federal park in Pennsylvania. And let me be clear, as David Marcus, a, a Philly guy who writes at the New York Post now, a columnist, guest on our program, he pointed out, this isn't some super woke radical city council that's doing this this is joe biden that's right this is the biden administration they said that the founder of pennsylvania 1681 uh his statue will be removed to make the park more inclusive just it just it never ends and you know william penn first of all who also predates america yeah he settled in well see colonist yeah (laughs) Right, there you're right. You go. And he built this city and developed this on rock and roll. That's right. <laughs> I can't even get through. I'm this. Sorry. Go ahead. I can't remember. See, see how it feels when you interrupt me, Julie. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> he was. Uh, he's known to have been amicable to the Native Americans in their relationship region. With yes. The Asians. So, I mean, if they're going to take William Penn down. It just never ends. Well, William and Penn people... was, it was white and European. That's right. That's the problem. So he's got to go. Yeah. He's, he's got, got to, to go. go. But And, and I, last I checked, Joe Biden is a hometown Pennsylvania boy from Scranton. Yeah, right? exactly. He should be proud of this. You would think. But no, he think. has no. self-hatred. Yes, self, and I a, do love that he's willing to use the imagery of Valley Forge and and George Washington. And then, as you say, tears down. It's a it's a. That's right. It's it we, really is. We, we use these icons to to prop ourselves up and to bolster our own American patriotism solely for one purpose only, which is to to shame and attack our political opponents and paint them as enemies of the state and also to shame those who might be on the boat. It's like, oh, gosh, the economy is terrible and our country is divided and our national security is bad, so there's no way I'm going to vote for Biden. I'll vote for Trump. But here comes Joe Biden riding on George Washington's coattail yeah. saying, if you vote for him, then you might as well be anti-George Washington. And then the second he has the opportunity, he tears down those very institutions that he claims to be the only one protecting. And and look, it's not just this incident. This has been happening th- throughout the nation. And Christina Hoff Summers wrote this great tweet um, uh, about the um, Smithsonian. Oh, and it is. Hold on, because we're going to no, no. okay. we're going to reveal to you Christina Hoff Summers, who's a, a brilliant uh, intellectual and historian, by the way. She did make a great point. We're going to share that with you in a little bit more analysis of it in a moment. As the Biden administration is coming after your statues, coming after your institutions, uh, it's 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 worse than you think. And this administration needs to hear from you. It's seven twenty one. Making sense of your world. There are a lot of things that really tick me off. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. Making sense of the news. WMAL FM, Woodbridge, Washington, a cumulus media station. Making sense of the news. News Talk 105.9. News. Now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 736. It's O'Connor and Company here on this Monday morning, the 8th day of January, coming up at 8.05. Tom Fitton, Judicial Watch, is suing the federal government over the death of Ashley Babbitt, and he will give you all the details. At 8.35, Congressman Chip Roy will be here. Find out what he has to say about the Secretary of Defense spending days in ICU without telling anyone. There's got to be a chain of command issue there, isn't there, Julie? You'd think. You would think. I'm Larry O'Connor, and that's Julie Gunlock. And it's Julie's favorite part of the week, where we dissect the Washington Commanders game. But it's going to be an extra special episode here with Trevor Maddis. 
because it was the last game of the season. So we get to sort of dissect the entire season and look forward to where the commanders go next. Are you you want to lead things off here? Julie? No, I don't. You sure? I heard they lost. They did. <laughs> <laughs> You could have said that any day this year, yeah, except exactly. for three. It was a stretch. Uh, Trevor, good morning. Happy end of the regular season. Good morning, Larry. Good morning, Julie. <laughs> so uh, I was at the game yesterday, and we were going to leave halfway through the fourth quarter, like most of the people there who weren't wearing blue and silver. And I said, no. I said, Meredith, I want to stay because I want to personally watch Ron Rivera walk off this field for the last time. Uh, please tell me that was the last time we are moving on for a new head coach, right? Yeah, they, they, they've got to not just move on from the head coach. I mean, from most of the front office, from everything. This will be a a uh, power washer full of not just water but bleach. They're going to <laughs> just completely clean house, I believe. Ron Rivera is one of the good guys in the game. Uh, it, it kind of breaks my heart after everything he's been through, fighting through cancer and all the other things that – it's come to this for him, but uh, it, it's got to be a change. So let's talk about the potential for that. I mean, if, if anybody cares, I mean, because the Redskins have been out of it for months now, uh, but they did lose to the Cowboys. Cowboys end up winning the division, which was lousy to see, if anyone knows the history of these two teams, of course, to see that happen on our field. Um, now we move into the offseason. They've got the number two draft pick. And if they are going to clean house, they've got some money to play with. They've got some cap room. They've got a good receiver. They've got a good young running. They've got a couple of good receivers. They've got a good running back. What are they going to focus this draft pick on? Well, they've got to focus on quarterback. I mean, they, they gave Sam Howell basically the entire year to start. and He looked good early in the season. He, he grew. He got better. You could see that he was not making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And that was encouraging from a standpoint of carrying him into next season as the starting quarterback and using that number two pick, now they didn't expect to be the number two pick, using their first round pick on a different position. But then things went south, Sam Howell regressed, and having the number two pick in the draft, they're going to have access to the top quarterbacks in this draft, and there are some very good ones, and I'd be stunned if they don't pick a quarterback with that number two pick. So you've got uh, Penix, the quarterback in Washington. You've got the the quarterback out of USC. You, there's quite a few quarterbacks. And a lot of these, unlike most draft seasons, uh, a lot of these guys are like in their sixth year because of COVID, right? So who are you eyeing? Uh, you know what? The, the, the top three are the kid out of LSU, Jaden Daniels, who won the Heisman Trophy, kid out of USC, Caleb Williams, and he's uh, a, he's a low, he, he went to year. he went to Gonzaga, didn't he? He's a DC kid, I think. Uh, oh, so, so I didn't realize that. Yeah. Uh, but he won the he won the Heisman Trophy uh, a year ago. Um, Daniels won it this year, and then the other one is Drake May at North Carolina, who's just a classic tall NFL style pocket passer who also has some movement. Now those are considered the top three guys you mentioned. The quarterback out of Washington, Michael Penix Jr., mm -hmm. uh, and we'll be able to see him tonight in the national championship game. He he has been just phenomenal. His problem is that his first four years in college football, each of those years, he suffered a season-ending injury. Yeah. Then the last two years at Washington, he was able to stay healthy, but that's that might make him fall down the, the draft a little bit. No quarterback is a slam dunk, absolutely going to be a success. But if you look at those top three, certainly – then I think you're going to have a very, very good risk. Caleb Williams, born in Washington, D.C., and graduate of Gonzaga College High School. That it seems made to order, and he's used to wearing a color similar to burgundy and gold there over at USC. Uh -huh. So we'll see how that goes. Do you think that the ownership of the team, are, they're going to uh, make their decision on head coach pretty rapidly? They've got to have a short list already worked out. Yeah, they, they have to really have a GM first because the GM needs to pick the head coach. But they've got to make that decision quickly um, because of uh, just getting the team built. Mm -hmm. But, again, I think that they need to take a breath, and going too fast is something that they don't want to do. And, and first they need to decide, once they get the GM settled, what direction they want to go. Do they want to go with a, with a veteran coach, uh, or do they want to go with a new hotshot? 
I mean, one name that's mentioned from a veteran standpoint is Dan Quinn, who's the defensive coordinator for the Cowboys. That has been a spectacular defense that he's coordinated there, and he's got a lot of experience. I mean, 21 years of coaching at really every level in the NFL. But the other is to do what the Rams did with Sean McVay as their head coach and the 49ers did with Kyle Shanahan, go with a young hotshot with a new direction. And those two coaches that I just mentioned were offensive coaches, one of the most coveted coaches this year in the head coaching position will be Ben Johnson, who's the Lions offensive coordinator. He helped to turn that place around and revive Jared Goff's career at quarterback. So, you know, they've got to decide when they get a new GM, do we want to go with the, with an old hand who's been through the battles or do we want to go with the young hotshot and hope he can be the next Kyle Shanahan or Sean McVay? Well, so now people listening to this right now, Trevor, are going to say, hold on a minute, we've got – an offensive coordinator right now he's only had one year but but he came from the Chiefs in Eric Bieniemy, and he was he was considered one of the top young offensive minds out there why not give him a chance well they will they'll, they'll interview him uh the thing is he's interviewed uh you know 16 times for head coaching jobs over the last several years hmm. and and he hasn't gotten one yet now he's assistant head coach with Washington, and certainly they will give him a chance, and he'll be under consideration uh, because of his work with Andy Reid with the Chiefs, and be, he's the head coach at the Chiefs, Reid, yeah. and you know the, the Super Bowls and the homes and all that stuff. So they'll give him a chance too. But remember that this offense, not all because of the enemy, this offense did regress over the course of the season. So he'll need to explain that in the interview process. Trevor, in November you picked Ohio State over Michigan, and then last week you picked Alabama over Michigan. Will you please pick the Washington Huskies for? tonight's game for me at this point i wouldn't pick the baltimore ravens over michigan i picking over michigan has just slapped me around you know they're taking a big old raw steak and whacking me on both sides of the face with it you know and 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 if it if it makes you feel better larry i did officially pick michigan not only to win but to cover so if they don't if michigan doesn't then that will be the last slap in the face for the season for me. So oh God, I did you, pick him to you, win though, because yeah. Yeah. Well, no, this, this is this, this matchup between Michigan and Washington for the college national championship. It's like the, the, you know, vaunted matchup of Mike Tyson and Muhammad Ali in their prime. Michigan is Mike Tyson. They just march up to you and smash you in the face until you can't take it anymore. Whereas Washington's like Ali, foot like a butterfly, sting like a bee, fantastic yeah. downfield passing attack. So this is going to be a battle of styles. It'll be a lot of fun. It will be, but I got to say, and, and obviously I'm a homer for the Wolverines, but Washington has not played a defense like this all season long. There's nothing like this Michigan defense, and I can't imagine they're going to be able to, to take the ball up and down the field the way they think they well the way they've been able to all season but it'll be a great game let's hope that it's a blowout at halftime so i can go to sleep because i've got an early wake up call trevor so can we can you know we i'll go? call michigan coach jim harbaugh and make that request Please on your do. behalf tell him i said hi by the way thanks trevor I will. thanks for all the great thanks, insights this you. season we appreciate it and when it, uh, we get close to the draft or if we get a new announcement for a new head coach we will uh tap into your genius <laughs> thanks uh, everybody want, great anything to add here julie Thanks, Trevor. You're my favorite guest. <laughs> oh, you got a lot there, awesome. did you? I did. Can we get a little go I'm blue? Trying. Go blue. A little go blue. I'm go blue. It's 7:45. Oh, that's from a Buckeyes fan. <laughs> WMAL traffic and weather every 10 minutes. For- Making sense of your world. Greatly appreciated. News Talk 105.9 WMAL. I love listening to you. Making sense of the news. We are going to the moon. Are you excited? commercial spacecraft bound for the lunar surface lifted off from Cape Canaveral Monday. It's the first launch of a U.S. space mission designed to land softly on the moon since the last Apollo flights of 1972. This is uh, pretty cool. It's called the Peregrine spacecraft. It's designed by Astrobotic, an aerospace company based out of Pittsburgh. And uh, the launch was the first of the United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket. And we're heading back to the moon. And this is the beginning of that entire process of going back to the moon. And then we'll have a base on the moon. And then that will be part of the um, further space exploration. I saw this in a Star Trek movie once. (laughs) (laughs) When did the Furbies show up? (laughs) No, those were Tribbles. Furbies are different. Oh, gosh, I messed that up. Sorry. Oh, dear. It's the first step in a perilous and complicated journey to the moon, but if all goes well, the six-foot-tall lander is expected to touch down on February 23rd, 
And uh, Intuitive Machines, a Houston-based venture led by NASA veterans, announced late Friday that it's aiming to land a spacecraft on the lunar surface a little earlier than that, potentially eclipsing astrobotics. It's basically a race to the moon. Mm. Uh, its launch is expected to come mid-February on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, but this is a commercial enterprise. So, you know, soon there will be billboards on the moon. Would you go? To the moon? Yeah. Would you buy a seat? If I didn't have to go on a rocket, I would. Yeah. I just, I don't like the idea of, uh, rockets blow up, and I don't want that to happen to me. Well, nothing bad happens with airplanes, as we've seen with no, consider. That I Portland mean, comparatively flight. speaking, no, things don't. Airplanes are hey, commercial airplanes are really, pop off. No one we got hurt. We covered this earlier. No one got hurt. Like today, we covered it. Okay, a panel pops off a rocket. You are dead. I guarantee it. <laughs> panel pops off a plane. You can still land successfully. As long See how as this you have works. Your seat-